Okay, we're to class three. I'm sorry that I have not kind of gotten within 50 minutes. Uh, uh, my apologies, I'll try to get this one uh, within that period of time. Um, so let's start off here with uh, uh, talking about this uh, very important, we've kind of been leading up to this as you can imagine, which is being prepared unto all good works. Uh, getting, going back to our last class, what we saw is the activity of the Spirit uh, is the power of God that's been consistent in the lives of believers going back all the way to the beginning uh, and that there is uh, in the way that the Lord deals with us there's an intimacy not one size that fits all God knows us he knows our level of faith our level of understanding and he works with us as an individual and if we forsake sin the Father and the Son will come and they will make their abode with us. We'll have more on that in class four. Uh, he is involved in shaping our minds to be like his. He's readying us for work that he has prepared in advance for us to do. Uh, this is the ability for God to know what's going to happen in our lives. He's going to present before us, before our feet, opportunities to serve, just like he did with Philip. And so what do we have to be willing to do? We have to be willing to say, yes, I'll do it. Um, and so he moves us, he guides us, he goads us in the right direction with the intent that we will find great comfort and encouragement from his work in our lives. We're going to sing this hymn, I believe, at the conclusion, unless I go too long, <laughs> uh, at the conclusion of this uh, section. One of my favorite uh, hymns in our hymn book. Again, uh, the the music you may or may not like, but the words are wonderful. Uh, I remember a, a brother um, who's since uh, fallen asleep in uh, the Los Angeles Ecclesia, and he talked about this being his favorite hymn because he didn't always understand why things had happened in his life. Uh, he lost his wife at an early age. Uh, he had had some real physical problems. And this is, just look at the words of this beautiful hymn. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Isn't that a wonderful hymn? So we're going to get a chance to sing that in a, in a few minutes. And that really, I think, is, is our prayer and confidence in God, is that he moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. And the wonders that he's working are in our lives, giving us courage because we know that he will break uh, with blessings on our head. Now, I do want to take uh, another one of these little rabbit uh, path discussions here to talk about self-examination because we talked about self-examination a few times and we also talked about how we are, the, we are God's workmanship. We're told that in Ephesians chapter 2. We're the workmanship of God. And so I'd like to just speak to Christadelphians since, since you know, we're all here together about self-examination and the way that we look at it. So, first of all, when we accurately compare ourselves to Christ, we need to identify threats and a need for correction. That's what self-examination is all about. And self-examination is absolutely critical to a child of God. And when it breaks, as we saw as an example for Samson, we become at great risk. However, we must remember that we are his workmanship. And so we need to rejoice when we see him changing us, when behaviors are being modified, and we need to acknowledge it and give thanks uh, to him for it. And when we do, when we, all we do is focus on our failures, we fail to live lives of purged consciences, as it says in the book of Hebrews. So what does this mean to us? Well, remember we're told in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 
that let a man examine himself so that he uh, let him eat of this bread and drink of that, of that cup. And the word examine is this word uh, dokamazo, which means to test metals or to remove impurities under intense heat. And so that's the process that we see whenever one is proving a metal such as gold. So the refinement isn't just to remove the dross and the impurities, which is very important, but it's to reveal the beautiful, purified gold that already existed. You see, that gold had some impurities that needed to be removed, but there was a beautiful, beautiful gold that existed there. So here's what self-examination may lead to for some. And I, I'm a little bit sorrowful when I see uh, during the breaking of bread, people who, after the breaking of bread, walk out with their chins on their chest, uh, feeling that they're miserable, feeling they're, they're, they're so terribly aware of their failures that it becomes extremely negative thinking. Let me just suggest a different way to look at it. First of all, none of, none of us are holy, and we hear this. Uh, none of us are holy. We are all flawed and of no inherent value. Now, is that a true statement? Do you think that God feels you're of no inherent value? Do you think that we are called today to be a holy people? We are called today to be a holy people. You are a holy people. That doesn't mean you're without sin. Doesn't mean you're not struggling with sin. We are called to be a holy people right now. And yes, we are flawed, but we are never, in God's eyes, of no, of no inherent value. We are not that way in his eyes. I hear people say, when I look at my life, all I see is failure, not living up to the standard. And it leads to a sad defeatism that we are sinners and we just have to count on God's grace to save us. But we ourselves are failures. Again, I'm going to go back to another hymn. Um, Hymn 81, everlasting, changing never, of one strength, no more, no less, thou almightiness forever, all the same thy holiness, God eternal, God eternal, all things, all dost thou possess. We poor weak ones, once poor sinners, would not in our weakness stay. We the low ones would be winners of the bright and living day, which ascending leads in Christ to perfect day. So I think this, this hymn really kind of captures the idea. So here's the, the, the problem of fleshly defeatism. Uh, we read this in, in Romans 5, uh, starting at verse 20 and going through chapter 6 of verse 1 through 3. Uh, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that, as, that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism to death, that like as, as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, I think sometimes if we always think of ourselves as a failure, that what we could end up doing is falling into this problem that Paul talked about, where people say, well, we're just sinners. We're just going to rely on the grace of God, as if we have no responsibility to live a holy lifestyle. The reality is, we are expected to be a holy people right now. So I'd like to suggest an alternate way for us to consider self-examination. Number one, I know that I am a work of art by God, and He is actively shaping me through various means. And that there are areas that I can clearly see where he has already changed me. And I can see that there's been dross removed. And that there are some areas where the change process is still ongoing. And I can look at my life and I can see where it's beginning to take the change. And I can see places 
where I haven't allowed it to take yet. But furthermore, there are areas where it's clear that I need to be more receptive to his direction. So what we need to do is praise the worker, the workmanship, the artist. So when you speak a word in season to another person, praise God for that. When you, because of your conviction to serve God, pass by an avoided sin, like Solomon says, he says, don't go right next to it. He says, pass by it. Get away from it. When you do that, praise the artist. It's his work. When against every impulse of your flesh, you held your tongue. Hard to do, right? Praise the artist. When you suffered wrongful blame for Christ's sake, when you put aside your own desires to serve another, and when your study of the word unearths a treasure, praise the artist. We are his workmanship. This is a beautiful, beautiful way for us to look at what's going on in our lives. Okay, that's my rabbit trail. We'll come back now. I hope that's helpful to some of you. I think sometimes we, we just focus on all the errors and the mistakes we make, and we don't stop to recognize the wonderful ways that the Lord's already changing us. It's evidence of his involvement as, as, the, as the master of our, of our lives. Okay, so let's look at the work ahead. Again, there are two wrong views I think could happen. One would be, I accomplish this through my own spiritual insights and mastery of the scriptures. I did it. As I've said to a couple of people, that sounds like legalism. Or the other one, which is an evangelical idea, which God personally revealed to me what to do and made the choice plain. In other words, I didn't have any responsibility to think. I didn't need to read the word. God revealed to me what to do. Those are two wrong views. Here's another one. Because I'm, because I'm faithful, I did this important work. Or God did the work. I really had nothing to do with it. You see, these are, these are out of balance. And what we want to do is find a way to bring balance back to these. And this is the passage that we've been referring to a number of times. But we want to now focus on the last part at verse 10. Remember, in Ephesians chapter 2, we kept on focusing about how we had been a certain way, but now we're not. And that he has made us alive. We were dead. We once walked. We once lived. We were, by nature, the children of wrath. Um, but he has made us alive together. Uh, by grace, we have been saved. He has raised us up with him, made us to sit with him in heavenly places. For grace, you have been saved. Now, this is what he concludes at the end uh, at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that, ye, that we should walk in them. Now, I'm going to use a couple of other versions here, just for clarity's sake. The RSV, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Or the, uh, the English uh, Standard Version, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Um, the NIV, for we are God's handy, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And finally, the uh, Young's little tr literal translation, uh, for of him we are workmanship created in Christ Jesus to good works which God did before prepare that in them we may walk. So I don't know um, when it was I first read this passage and it really floored me. Um, I'm sure I, I read it many times before, and I didn't read it carefully. But when I, when I read this, and I started to think about how my life is not some kind of happen chance. It's not some kind of thing that just kind of develops over time, but that God has a master plan in my life, and he's going to be putting work in front of me to do. He's prepared that in advance. Have you ever thought about your life that way? That there's work that God's got to, he's prepared in advance for you to do. And the big question is, are you going to say yes? Are you going to be prepared? Are you going to have the faith 
that will allow you to do that work. This is uh, not the only place it shows up. It shows up in Romans chapter 9 at verses 21 through 28, talking about the potter. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and, to a, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. It's the same idea. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, prepared in advance. So this afore prepared is Paul talking about being a chosen vessel in Acts chapter 9. And in Ephesians, is talking about being prepared in advance work ordained that we are to do. So what's our role? Jesus speaks about this in John 6, uh, verses 27 through 29. Jesus says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, it, perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. We've seen that word before, right? Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So the context of this is the miracle of the loaves and the disciples asking what they should do to do the works of God. And what was the Lord's direction to them? Your, your job isn't to figure out the master plan of God. Your job is to believe. Believe. And if you believe, God will bring about things in your life that you will be able to serve him with. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The seal is, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. But if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or useful for the master's use. And here it is, and prepared unto every good work. So we need to purge ourselves from the things of the flesh. And when we do this, we will become a vessel of honor, sanctified and made meet for the master's use and for the work that's been prepared in advance for us. And that word seal is about a, a stamp that's impressed, a mark of privacy or genuineness. And that is that the Lord knows us and he's preparing us for good works. We can look at the idea of the atonement and our work. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and, go and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's what's wrapped up in the atonement. The very sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is to allow us to have minds that have been purged from death, from the dead works, to allow us to serve the living God. So you might say this is one way to look at it. We're not saved by works. You know, that was the argument that was going on uh, in the first century. But you could say we're being saved for works, works that are planned for us to do. Now, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was very clear about this. He said in John 5 and 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That's a pretty important clue for us about what we need to be doing. And that is not to seek our own will, but the will of our Father. When we do that, then we will be prepared unto all good works. 
So it's critically important to understand the work of Jesus. His work uh, was just and righteous because his mind was spiritually focused on the will of his Father and not his own. And this is a key to our service. Get our minds in line with the will of God. In John 17, in this wonderful uh, chapter of prayer for the Lord Jesus, as he speaks to his disciples, he, uh, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus knew that his role was not just to have a spiritual mind, but because of that, to be able to do work that the Father had given him. I have manifested thy name unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now this is a picture, uh, an artist rendering of what um, the city of Athens may have looked like at the time of the Apostle Paul, uh, when he goes to Athens, uh, recorded in Acts 17 for us. I, I can't be certain of this, but um, I think that Athens was a pretty big disappointment for Paul. Um, I had an opportunity a few years ago to go to Athens and to stand on Mars Hill, which was very underwhelming, by the way. It's just kind of a little marble uh, hill that sta sits there, and it was broiling hot. Uh, but when you stood there and you looked out, what the Apostle Paul would have seen would have been I think this must be the place where, where the Lord has brought me, and this is where the gospel's really going to take off. This was the center of Greek and Roman thought. This is where all the leaders that were, that were there, were, were, they were all there focused. And he gets this opportunity to address these leaders. And as he does this, he goes around, I, I think actually because there's a place where the wind comes up and it was a really hot day, and if you stood there, this is where I think the images were that were all over this kind of marble rock. And he would have stood there and the wind would have come up and I think he was probably going over there if nothing more than just to cool down. And as he's doing this, he's looking at all these images that were all there and he sees the image to the unknown God. And that is whenever he goes back and uses that for the wonderful speech that he gives on Athens. And I, I believe that he really hoped and believed that this was where it was going to happen. Um, but do you recall what happened with him? It wasn't the big reception, was it? There, there were some that believed, primarily women uh, that believed, but it wasn't the big reception that he was hoping for. Here's where the reception was. It was going to be in Corinth. It's where... This is, this is not where I think the Apostle Paul was expecting that this was going to really take off. If you really study the history of Corinth, this is not the good place to go. This is a place where uh, a lot of freed slaves, hundreds of thousands, were dumped into the city, where they were involved in some of the worst idolatry and pagan uh, life that you can imagine. And that's exactly where the response to the scripture and response to the, um, uh, to the gospel takes up. And this is what he's told in Acts chapter 18. Uh, then spake the Lord to Paul in the, in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there for 18 months, teaching the word of God among men among them, and actually returns to being a tent maker in this city. Well, you see that, just to go back to that for a moment, sometimes what we think are the obvious things, these are the, these are the big opportunities, might not always be exactly what the Lord had planned. Now, there were some response in Athens. And the reason I bring this one up is I'm always quite amazed when we run seminars um, in the public, I'm always amazed. It seems like there's some people that at the beginning you see their exuberance for the truth. I mean, it's like you go home and you can't stop thinking about it. They're so excited. I remember this one time, uh, you will, you'll be surprised to hear this, but I went overtime on one of my classes <laughs> and um, I, I, it was about the promises. And I, at the end of it, I looked up and it was instead of 9 o'clock, it was like 9.03. 
maybe 905. <laughs> anyway, and, and I said, uh, I apologize. I went over and, and this woman in the front says, that's okay. We would have sat here all night to hear that. And I thought to myself, oh, that's wonderful. There's, there's the person who's going to be the person who's going to be baptized. Nope, not at all. She was very excited about that. It was, it were people who were in the back who I didn't even recognize, uh, who didn't say really anything at all during the seminars. There were oftentimes the people who stuck with it. You see, our ability to figure out exactly where God's taken us, we're not too good at that, are we? And we're certainly not very good at judging where the gospel is going to take or not take. We think it's in Athens, it's in Corinth. And I think this is important for us. We just need to be willing to preach wherever we are put. So what are the conditions of a people of, that are zealous of good works? For the grace that we're through this in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's our job. Deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So that, that is what we are hoping for, to be purified by the Lord so that we will be prepared and zealous of good works. So there's a pattern that's emerging. Our first role is to believe and to forsake ungodliness and fleshly lust. If we're willing to do that, if we are willing to put aside the, the lust of the flesh, then what happens is that we allow our minds to be a habitation for the spirit. But whenever we try to have a foot in both and we allow fleshly lust to be in our lives, it is not a place for the habitation of the spirit. As a holy people, we are to learn and to grow from the experiences that the Lord exposes to us. And it is the Lord who quickens us and prepares us for work that lies ahead. We are his work of art. And because of this, he will provide us with an opportunity to serve. I know I hear young brethren sometimes say, you know, what can I do? What, what work can I do? Uh, should I go off to the mission uh, land? You know, should I go off and do preaching work? Uh, should I do this or that? You know what? One way to do it is whatever is in front of you. Whatever is in front of you. And the Lord will take you where he needs you to go. So the Spirit is leading and shaping and preparing us unto all good works. And that's why we're told how the Lord himself learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, we've seen that word before, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Paul talked about this when he talked about the thorn in the flesh. And we could have debates here about what the thorn in the flesh. If you want a good Christadelphian debate, ask people what they think the thorn in the flesh is. I have my opinion. I bet you you have one too. Uh, but he does say this. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We've seen that word before. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the idea that we need to have, that we, when we become face to face with our weaknesses, we can recognize that the power that is given to us to do what we need is from the Lord. You know, Joseph, interesting, what an interesting character. Uh, his father, Jacob, sometimes you look at and you say, wow, this guy had some problems, right? Let's this, this admit it. He had a long journey to get where he got to at the end of his life. But Joseph, we, just, we don't hear anything badly about Joseph, right? Um, but it's interesting. 
he was prepared for a great work and he didn't know it. Um, Genesis 45, Joseph said to his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. That's what God's purpose was. That was the work he prepared in advance for me. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and, there are, there, uh, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So you read that and you say, well, see, Joseph knew this the whole time, didn't he? Joseph knew that he was going to uh, be the one that was going to save. Uh, no, not really. He, that's what happened. But was he always aware of God's plan? Well, first of all, look at the names of his children. Genesis 40, verses 50 through 52. Joseph had two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. What does Manasseh mean? For God said, he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second was called Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Here's when Joseph recognized God's hand. It was in Ch Genesis 41, verses 8 through 9. Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. And we saw them bowing down before them. He remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of them. And he said, you're spies to see the nakedness of the land. Are ye come? You see, I think what happened is this is when the penny dropped, so to speak. Is whenever he saw his brethren bowing down before him, he remembered a dream he had back in his teenage years. And he was seeing it unfolding right in front of him. And at that point, he was able to understand God's plan and purpose in his life and how God had brought him into a position to do a great work, which was to save the people of Israel. Uh, I think it's a wonderful story about Joseph, how he came to this awareness. Well, how about Moses? Moses, was he prepared unto all good works? You know, um, you read about Moses... Um, living, he had three separate periods of life. 40 years when the wisdom of, of Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and 40 years leading Israel. And you have to say, from a human standpoint, from a productivity standpoint, kind of a, not a good use of his life, right? I mean, if you think about it, at age 40, Moses pretty much thought he was ready to lead the people out of, uh, out of Egypt, didn't he? He thought he could take it into his own hand, but he was not ready. It was all about Moses at that point. In fact, to the point that he was willing to kill an Egyptian, right? And bury him in the sand. That was not the Moses that God wanted to do the work that he was going to do. And so what does he do? He puts him in a shepherd role for 40 years in Midian. And when he has finally reached a point where he is now a humble man, he brings him back for the last 40 years of his life to lead Israel. You can see how God was preparing him for good work. And that's why it's interesting when you read places like Exodus chapter 4, you know, Moses at this point, and this is, I'm taking this from the Diaglot, um, I mean, it's from the Septuagint. Moses said unto the Lord, I pray, Lord, I have not been sufficient in former times, neither from the time that thou hast begun to speak to thy servant. I am weak and speech and slow tongued. Now, you might think, well, okay, that's an example of how he didn't have confidence because he couldn't speak. He wasn't an orator, right? Wrong. Because we're also told in Acts chapter 7. When Moses was born, he was exceeding fair, nursed up in his father's house three months, and he was cast, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. 
This is a different man after 80 years of life. He's been humbled uh, to the point that he probably shouldn't have made this conclusion uh, because even though Aaron is said to be the one who's going to do the speaking for him, it doesn't take very long where Moses is doing all the speaking. It looks as you go through scripture. So again, uh, he was aware of his insufficiency. He was a different kind of man. And so we read passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now look, what we have, we have this treasure. It's a great treasure. But what's it in? It's in earthen clay jars, earthen vessels. Now why is it that this great treasure is inside of these weak vessels? It's that the excellency of the power of God may be the power of God and not us. Our job is to bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And so we are these clay jars. And our job is to bear about, to convey or transport, as we're told in Hebrews 13, where it says to go outside the city. It says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So this is the point, is that our, the strength that we need to show, it's not about us. It's about being able to show the power of the living God in our lives. So being prepared unto all good works. As we said before, there are times when people who have suffered are in a unique place to serve others. If you have suffered what it's like to be out of a job, to struggle to feed your family, to have the, the feelings that come along with that of, of maybe not being sufficient, doubting yourself. Well, in those kind of cases, you can help a person going through that in a way that nobody else can. And those who have experienced the joys of preaching the gospel can reach out to others and help them to taste and to see. Those who had experienced the loss of a job, I already talked about that one, can talk to an emotionally distraught person going through that. And those who have struggled with a sin and escaped can be the covert in the storm for those who are experiencing similar issues. Of course, that assumes that we would actually talk about that. But it's important for us to recognize that we are being prepared through so many ways to be able to serve. That's why Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, given me the strength, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, beloved brethren, uh, beloved brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And he goes on to say, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So how do we apply, how do we apply this to ourselves? I mean, this, let's try to get practical about this. Sometimes we lack natural talent. Now, from my point of view, if it's working, who cares what it looks like, right? And uh, there are times, <laughs> there are certain things we just aren't naturally given to, such as uh, repairing a water heater, as you can see here. Um, there are times we lack natural talent. We can conclude that, you know, Maybe it's better off to have somebody who actually knows how to do this do it. But that's the way to look at the things, uh, things of the flesh, not the things of the spirit. In the truth, is it humility or lack of faith when we say, I'm not good at Bible study. I'll let somebody else teach this person because I'm not really good at Bible study. Or... I'm not a good speaker or a teacher, or I'm not good at preaching to my friends. So because of those things, I'm not gonna try it. Uh, years ago, and I, I gave this at a Bible school here uh, several years ago, about 2009 or eight or something like this, 
um, I did a little study about the truth in this area, right in this area, getting started with, uh, uh, with a brother Banta. And he brought a brother Oatman in to teach the truth because he said, I'm trying to feed my family. I've got a subsistence situation here. I'm a farmer. I don't have money and I don't have time. So I'm going to bring a brother in who is pretty knowledgeable and I'm going to have him teach the truth. And he did. A brother, brother Oatman came in and all Brother Banta did was prepare a place for the talks to be held. By the way, they would, went on for three days. Uh, try doing that today. Um, three days worth of talks by Brother Oatman. And so he created a place that it could happen. The seating was for 275. 275 people showed up for these lectures. These were the aliens, by the way. Um, now here's the interesting thing. As you follow through Brother Banta's life, you know what you find? Progressively, he becomes not only a good student, but an able speaker and a, and a very gifted debater. It's a great lesson for us, isn't it? I know some people are related here, so you know the story better than me. But you know, this is what happens when we actually try things, when we actually say yes, the Lord will give us strength in areas we don't have strength. Remember this, where we, where we are rooted to, in Christ in love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Are you fearing that you may not be perfect at this? You know, you know what Truth Corps kids always tell us? They're, they're frantically preparing before Truth Corps, getting ready for Truth Corps. And you know what they find out? They knew more than most people did. They actually find out that they actually knew quite a bit. And it's oftentimes fear that keeps us from doing things. But if we have love, the love of God in our life, it's cast, it casts out fear. You know, we always talk about Peter walking on the water, you know, and it's right here that faith is built. It's not in that ship. It's actually venturing out and going into places where there's danger. There's the threat of failure. That is, you know, by the way, other than the Lord Jesus, that's the only a person who walked on the water. Peter did. He walked on the water. Now he also took his eye off of it and got afraid and lost his faith and he began to sink. But the Lord was there to pick him up, wasn't he? So faith is built when we actually get out of the boat and try things. Now I'm going to talk, this is where it gets dangerous, I'm going to talk about my own personal experience. I love having the opportunity to preach the truth. I love it. Uh, there are many here that are better than me at it and, are, and, and probably do it more frequently. But anytime I get a chance to be able to talk about the truth, it's wonderful. Um, here's what I will tell you. And I'm not saying this is a Holy Spirit gift at all. But I will say there are times where I've had the, ex the experience of just the appropriate passage coming to mind just at the right time in a class. Now... It's pretty magical when it happens. It's not a verse I was prepared to go to. It's, it's not a verse that was written down for me to go to. Oftentimes there are passages I hadn't thought about recently and certainly wasn't planning to discuss during the class. But when it happens, it's a deeply spiritual experience which leaves me feeling something special is going on. But I can tell you this, I have never had that happen with a passage that I've never read before or studied. Right? You gotta study it first. Do you believe that the Lord can help you to this level when you're talking to someone? Has that, I won't ask for a show of hands, but has that ever happened to you where something pops in your mind that you're not really sure where it came from? Sometimes we, oh, I, it was back there, I just needed to, uh, to get it. Well, no, sometimes it's not about us, right? I'm convinced that the Lord does assist me in my work, and I'm not alone. So, being a willing servant, we have to do our homework. There's just no easy way around that. For me, tasting what this is like makes me want to do this work every time I get a chance. I don't dread seminars. I dread the fact we don't have enough money to do them all the time. Um, they are ones where it gives us an opportunity to talk about the most important thing in our life and to see people's eyes light up when they see 
what the truth is all about. So it's a fundamentally different perspective. Cast aside our perceptions of what you can't do because that's evaluated through the lens of the, of the flesh. We can do all things through Christ who empowers and strengthens us, the apostle said, said in Philippians. He knows us and he knows our potential for faith and service and he's going to put us in the right place at the right time. Right when they're reading Isaiah 53, he's going to send us to the Gaza. And he will not take away, uh, excuse me, he will not take us the way of the Philistines if we're unable to succeed. But he does know what we can do and what we're capable of, and he has a master plan of good works for us to personally do. So the question is, will I, because of my lack of faith or my encumbrances in the world, find myself by limiting, my, uh, limiting God in my life? We're going to briefly look now at the role of scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. You all know this one, right? We use this to talk about scripture, that it's all inspired, right? Well, what is it really saying to us? It's saying that scripture is valuable for reproof. It's a testing, a proving. It is involved in correction, restoring us to an upright or, uh, or right state. Instruction, which is training or nurturing. And it does this to furnish us or to fully finish out or equip us. So why is it we need to do this? Why is it we need to be reproved, to correct, to be instructed? Why? Because the purpose is that we might be truly furnished unto all good works. What good is it for us to have wonderful academic knowledge if we're not going to do anything with it? We, must, we are to be truly furnished into all good works. And so that's why we're told that it's the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And that word is the word that's translated in the RSV as implanted. It's the implanted word which is able to save our souls. That's the only place it happens in scripture, this word engrafted. It's not grafted in as you see in Romans, like the wild olive tree into the, into the, good, wild, uh, the good tree, but it represents internal growth within the person. The word grows in us and is able to save our souls. And that's why we're told the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are, are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what's the message to our community? The word is tangible. It's a tangible, powerful manifestation of the spirit. It is active and it drives rightful change in our mind. And while the spirit abides with us by the dwelling of the power of Christ in our lives, it is a primary source of of strength and power to our spirit. And the Lord speaks to us through the same word and it prepares us for good works prepared in advance. Furthermore, the extraordinary spiritual experience of reading scripture provides us with the ultimate use of our minds. Nothing else can use our minds the way that the reading of scripture can do. It's not a book of knowledge. It's not, a, it's not about book knowledge. It's about understanding the mind of Christ so that we can think and act like him and do good works. So what's the exhortation to modern believers? What are the lessons about the sufferings that we endure? Why sometimes our work and efforts may not be as fruitful as we'd like? What does it tell us about what we think we are and are not capable of? Or about our need to plan out our work as if it all depends on us? Or to take pride over the work that we do. Brothers and sisters, the Lord's power in our lives is active and it's involved. And we have a responsibility to abstain from fleshly lust and ungodliness. We'll take a look at that in our next session. We need to exhibit love since this is the ultimate manifestation of the Spirit being active in our lives. If we're not loving our brother, we need to step back and to look at that because that is the ultimate manifestation, love of our brother. 
We must recognize that the Father and the Son desire intimacy, intimacy with us, and they know us better than we know ourselves. And because of that, we are a work of art being prepared for good works, and then progressively in our lives, we then should become more and more conscious of the wind moving us in our lives. We can, during the events, actually begin to see how we're being prepared for something. The Lord's actively working in my life. So we need to put up a sail and be zealous of the work that he gives us. And ultimately, it's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we will have a class this evening, but it'll be to discuss a few items. And then tomorrow during Sunday school, we'll conclude with, by this ye shall know, where we're going to take a look specifically at the idea of the comforter and what we can know about the Lord making his abode with us.